Welcome. We are going to jump into St. Augustine and his Confessions. The Confessions of St. Augustine. All right. Today is 26 June 2017 from St. Xavier University campus in Orland Park, Illinois. Okay, I would watch this Augustine documentary. This guy knows a lot more than I do. I don't know anything about Augustine. So watch this guy, and he hits a lot of the topics we talk about in the reading responses. So that 57 minutes is well worth it. I would get your text out, your Ryan text, it looks like that on the right, and get your reading responses out and actually try to knock out your reading responses as you watch this video, or at least take notes. Be aware of the reading response questions when you watch this documentary. All right. So let's start jumping into this stuff. Yeah, you really don't need what I'm about to, this lecture I'm doing. I just watch that guy. And then we can discuss things on the discussion board. Remember, get this edition. There's the ISBN number. You can buy it from that spot down there or the bookstore. I dreamed I saw St. Augustine. Joan Baez and all these people sing that uh, Bob Dylan song. So listen to that sometime. Frederick Copleston, he still has written his five, six volumes. History of Philosophy, one of the most thorough introductions, just walking through each philosopher in the different eras. He says this, In Latin Christendom, the name of Augustine stands out as that of the greatest of the fathers, both from a literary and from a theological standpoint. A name that dominated Western thought, notwithstanding the Aristotelianism of St. Thomas Aquinas and his school, especially as this Aristotelianism was very far from disregarding and still further from belittling the great African doctor. Indeed, in order to understand the currents of thought in the Middle Ages, a knowledge of Augustinianism is essential. So if Copleston thinks this guy's important, then you guys should. I want to say some of these things. Philosophy is never done in a vacuum. Everybody is responding to something else. Everyone is building upon the work of the intellectual giants in the past. A lot of philosophy can be understood as reactions to somebody else. So therefore, to understand what Kant's doing in reaction to Hume, you might have to understand a little bit about Hume. So we see elements of Augustine's influence in the Christian church, in the West in general, in the worldviews of many different kinds. Um, not only did he make some important epistemological distinctions, like dis the distinction between simple seeing, seeing as, and seeing that, which many of my friends deny, that distinction that simple seeing is possible, um, which I think is actually true. The ethics of war and other areas are still cited today. And his conversion, I think, is instructive as well. If a personal God exists and loves us, then this God knows how to get to each one of us personally. So even if you're an atheist, I would still encourage you to pray the atheist prayer. God, if you exist and if you love me, show me where you're working in my life. Find me. Show me you're real. I mean, Jesus said, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. But if you don't seek, you won't find. If you don't knock, the door won't be open. That's what Peter Kreft says, K-R-E-E-F-T, in one of his uh, books. All right, well, more about this. I've never seen this movie. I just found it. I want to check it out to see what's going on. But the confessions, I think, are just fantastic. And he really does confess everything. He uh, confesses some sins that I don't know if most people would confess if they uh, were writing a similar, similar autobiography. All righty. So if you read some of the introduction in the Ryan book, you don't need this. 
but uh, yeah, it's the eastern border of modern Algeria, Thagaste, however you pronounce it. Saint Mon it's a Christian mother, Saint Monica, and a pagan father, Patricus. He studied rhetoric at Carthage at age 17. That's after uh, his year of sin when he was 16 years old. And finally, uh, he found a sponsor to pay for his schooling. And his journey is very interesting. He's going to go through this intellectual and spiritual journey from being taught Christianity as a kid to then moving on to paganism, Manichaeanism, skepticism, Neoplatonism, and then the intellectual conversion to Christianity, and then the emotional conversion. Where if you guys know your New Testament, faith is not a blind faith as many people talk about today. Faith is actually a trust in something you have good reason to believe is true. So I like to use the ice example where, oh, you have a belief and you have evidence that the ice is three inches thick so you can park your truck on it. But until you actually go out on there, go out on, the, on that ice, then you're not having faith or that trust in that ice to hold you up. All right, bring this up on the discussion board. Um, yeah, I think we have to get clear on our words what we mean by faith. Um, Aquinas will mean something different, but all right. So, yeah, his personal journey. His father became a Christian, I think, before he, right before he died. And, yeah, his overall story, Augustine moved to Carthage to study rhetoric. That's where he found his mistress and produced his son, Adiodatus, which uh, has some connection to the, the son of Baal, gift of Baal, the god Baal, I think it means in Latin. And his initial problem with Christianity is a problem of evil. And chapter 7, we'll take a look at that if you guys want to do a little uh, interlude and deal with the problem of evil, which is a lot of major, one of the major reasons why people reject uh, theism today or Christianity or any other version of theism. And we want to we'll look at a little bit about Manichaean philosophy and what uh, some of the problems were with that. His uh, toying with academic skepticism before he becomes a Neoplatonist with uh, Plotinus. And this helped him answer the problem of evil. And then eventually, the Bishop of Milan, Ambrose, St. Ambrose, helped him show that Christianity was the most reasonable worldview. He had his intellectual conversion. And finally, later, he had the emotional conversion. Where he knew it was true, just like a guy knows the ice will hold you until you actually step out on that ice and give your life to that ice, you really haven't had faith. It's just mere justified true belief. So yeah, we'll talk about his conversion in Book 8, see what you think. So yeah, North Africa, if you look down there. You know, we're going to come back. I think we discussed, I mean, Socrates had a view that no one does evil willingly. It's not because of ignorance. Aristotle's going to disagree and thinks that we can exhibit acrasia or weakness of will. Where, and so, some of this discussed on the discussion board, you might want to throw it in here to see where he found this. Um, yeah, if you want to look at uh, Book 5, Chapter 10, Paragraph 18 in groups or on the discussion board, look at that and see if you think that's a good answer why we do wrong. You can rest in that. Um, if you want to pause it here and read Manichaean Dualism or Google it. Basically, Mani was this third century prophet. 
and yeah, Gnostics were an esoteric sect. Esoteric, that means just they have knowledge other people don't have. So Gnostics might teach something to the public, but then when they go in their closed room, they give them the real knowledge. That's kind of kind of a Gnostic esoteric sect. Some claim that Christianity was like that. And Paul and other people um, after him, especially, were writing against the Gnostics to knock out those heresies. This is good and evil. It's dualism. So God and darkness, or Muzd Ahirimin, I don't know how to pronounce these. These guys are equally powerful, so neither is strong enough to overtake the other. So the strife is eternal between them. This is very different than Christianity, where there is a God that's wholly powerful, that omni, omnibenevolent, omnipresent, and all the omni properties. Okay, metaphysical anthropology. This is just what are the core elements of human beings? What are they? It says this. And the, and the souls of humans, which are composed of light, is a good principle. But it's always in strife with the dark principle of the body. So, Augustine was attracted by the materialism of this view. So, he could not defend how a non-physical reality could resist at this time in his life. Um, what page is this? Let's, book 5, 10... 18. So, to quote in the middle of this paragraph, page 87, I still thought that it was not ourselves who sin, but that some sort of different nature within us commits the sin. It gave joy to my pride to be above all guilt, and when I did an evil deed, not to confess that I myself had done it, so that you might heal my soul, since I had sinned against you. I love to excuse myself and to accuse I know not what other being that was present with me, but yet was not I. But in truth, I was the one whole being, and my own impiety had divided me against myself. That sin was the more incurable, whereby I judged myself to be no sinner. So, this is very interesting. The dark soul in him caused him to sin, not... He did not choose it himself. All right. What is Neoplatonism? This, well, this worldview freed him some materialism. Plotinus talked about the one in these principles. I think uh, Ryan does a good job of explaining this in the uh, introduction. But... For Augustine, it was very interesting. He said that evil is simply a privation of the good. So just like um, when we talked about Aristotelian properties, drunkenness is not a property for Aristotle. People are just more or less sober. So we don't want to give a positive existence to drunkenness on their view. Just like we don't want to give a positive existence to evil just things are more or less good. There is no real evil property. And thanks to Neoplatonism, this actually freed him up intellectually to consider Christianity as a possibly true worldview. Here's a medieval picture of Augustine. A few heretics. I still don't know what that is. Is that a bundle of sticks? What is that? A couple of different heresies. Early Christian Church went through a, a bunch of different heresies. Uh, Pelagian heresy said sin only affected Adam, so our will is free from sin. So basically, we don't need God. It's you have less of a need for God's grace, and all of us can potentially go about our lives sinless. And so, um, people thought that. God's grace could be actually earned on human merit. So this would be a works-based salvation versus a grace-based salvation, which is antithetical to Christianity. 
Uh, Donatist heresy. They were kind of a church where priests have to be faultless. Church emphasized righteousness. Church needs saints, not sinners. And if priests were not sacraments are only effective when administered by priests in a state of grace. So priests have to be faultless. So baptism by a um, one of these bad priests is not a true baptism, that type of thing. So a lot of these uh, sacraments are not effective, which is a huge problem for people who believe in the sacraments and these kind of things. And if you have put that much of a burden on the priest. All right. Again, watch that 57-minute documentary. It will help tremendously. Also, don't forget uh, the Helps in Ryan's books. He gives a quick three-page overview at the back, which I think is good. It's so hard. All right, Augustine's Confessions. Yeah, when you cite and you're reading responses, it's easiest to do this. 1, 2, 15. I mean, people differ different ways. You can use Roman numerals. Um, if you want, or do it like that. All right. Reading response rr.ac.11, books 1, 2, and 3. Great are you, O Lord, and exceedingly worthy of praise. Your power is immense and your wisdom beyond reckoning. And so we men, who are a due part of your creation, long to praise you, we also carry our mortality about with us, carry the evidence of our sin, and with it the proof that you thwart the proud. You arouse us so that praising you may bring us joy, because you have made us and drawn us to yourself, and our heart is unquiet until it rests in you. Another translation, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Now, with your, these reading responses, Augustine is a smart guy. All of us are smart people, but even smart people have smart have a difficult time understanding what other smart people say. So we're all going to disagree about our interpretations of the text. So in your reading responses, you know, remember full paragraphs, short quotes, cite, cite, cite. Anytime you mention the text, and let's try to get at what Augustine's saying and what he means, and uh, we might disagree about what he says, but uh, or maybe we can help each other find a better translation and meaning ourselves. Meaning. Okay. We need to discuss this on the discussion board. Could this be true? Could God be the human heart's deepest longing? What kind of existential evidence or experiential evidence could confirm this? Is this possible to know by testimony of others alone? Is this a testable hypothesis? St. Augustine believed in natural theology. This is where we can look around at the world and we can use reason to make and think that the best explanation of the existence of this thing is a loving, holy, personal God. So, Augustine thinks there is evidence all over the place. So, to atheists who say there is no evidence for God's existence, Augustine would say, well, what about this, 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 it's everywhere. What do you think? So, him, Augustine, when you read this, you're going to see all these different nat arguments by natural theology. Where you have all this evidence that, and in his early life, he didn't realize it was God helping him, God being merciful, God behind whatever. But later in his life, he's like, whoa, this was God doing this. Or God did such and such. Or God is the best explanation of this and that phenomenon. All right, so you atheists out there, I would encourage you, hey, God, are you the only thing that will satisfy me? This, what satisfies, what is the heart's deepest longing? Augustine was, um, sought all kinds of things, power or reputation, fame, um, women. He shoved all this stuff to see if he could be happy when really what he really wanted all along was to know God. Okay? Now, I think, and the writers of the New Testament think, that actually this is a testable hypothesis. 
Jesus said he will give you, Paul, um, Jesus offers the fellowship of the easy yoke. So, we, if we follow the person of Jesus, and Jesus was who he said he was, we should experience this peace that passes all understanding, as Paul says. All right. Chapters 14, 16. What are the problems with the moral literature for Augustine? These relate to our issues of free speech and whatnot and the philosophy of art, aesthetics. And I think uh, some of you who are art majors or design or engineering majors might find those interesting. And as parents, um, what kind of stuff you allow your kids to see or the impact of immoral literature or movies on your own life or music. So you artists might find that interesting. And Plato thought Homer was horrible. Socrates, if you remember from the Euthyphro, he's like, I can't believe you believe this crazy stuff about the gods and so on. But I think this is important to talk about. How have the arts impacted you morally, one way or the other? Have they led you to virtue? Have they led you to vice? I've had different friends say this kind of music makes them do X, Y, Z. They listen to other music and makes them want to be holy, happy, healthy beings. You be the judge. Oh. And what about the solution to this? Some people think that there should be top-down control over us. So limit people's liberty in the arts in order to provide virtue. Now Hitler was one example of this. In Plato's Republic, there was top-down control where the philosopher kings would control. What do you guys think? So yeah, Hitler agreed with this. Top-down control destroyed degenerate art. Can we trust individuals and families to do it? Is it the job of the parent to do it? Is it the problem with consumers wanting it? So what about placing some blame on the directors of radio stations or publishing houses or movie producers? The FCZ, Congress. Should a moral artist be protested and shamed? like some of the liberal left tend to do, to silence them. You be the judge, get on the discussion board, tell us what you think. All right. By the way, here's other things to discuss. Any of these things, I'm going to read some of these things right now, but uh, you might want to mention any of these things for your part two if you're stuck. Just kind of look up these different chapters and tell us what you think. All right. Augustine's Prayer, page 4, book 1, chapter 5. Who will give me help? so that I may rest in you. Who will help me so that you will come into my heart and inebriate it to the end that I may forget my evils and embrace you, my one good? What are you to me? Have pity on me so that I may speak. What am I myself to you that you command me to love you and grow angry and threaten me with mighty woes unless I do? Is it but a small affliction if I do not love you? Unhappy man that I am, in your mercy, O Lord my God, Tell me what you are to say what you are to me. <coughs> Excuse me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. <coughs> say this, so that I may hear you. Behold, my heart's ears are turned to you, O Lord. <coughs> Open them and say to my soul, I am your salvation. I will run after that voice and I will catch hold of you. Do not hide your face from me, lest I die, let me die, so that I may see it. And six. Too narrow is the house of my soul for you to enter into it. Let it be enlarged by you. It lies in ruins. Build it up again. I confess and I know that it contains things that offend your eyes. Yet who will cleanse it? Or upon what other than you shall I call? For my secret sins cleanse me, O Lord, and from those of others spare your servant. I believe and therefore I speak out. 
Lord, all this you know. Have I not accused myself to you, my God of my sins? And have you not forgiven the iniquity of my heart? I do not contend in judgment with you who are truth itself. I do not deceive myself, lest my iniquity lie to itself. Therefore I do not contend in judgment with you. For if you, O Lord, will mark iniquities, Lord, who shall stand it? Now I like, I like a lot in this passage. I like how he addresses God throughout this work. It's very interesting. A lot of these medievals, they actually address God in their philosophical works. Here he does in his confessions. I like that he thinks God is all truth and that he needs his heart and soul to be enlarged. So ask yourself, is this possibly true? Is Augustine possibly right about that? That's what we want to know. As thinkers, philosophers, we're trying to figure this out. All right, chapter 9, we have adult cruelty and fallacy. Well, let me go back. Yeah, you can bring that up. But in section 15, we had to see this Braveheart quote. Lord, is there any man of so great a soul who clings to you with so mighty love? Is there anyone, I ask you, for indeed a certain type of stolidity is capable of this? Is there anyone who so devoutly clings to you and is thus so deeply affected that he deems of little consequence the rack, the hook, and similar tools of torture to be saved which men throughout the whole world pray to you with great fear, although he loves those who dread such things most bitterly. If there is such a man, he acts in the way in which our parents laughed at the torments we boys suffered from our teachers. No less measure did we fear our punishments, and no less did we beseech you to let us escape. All right. Yeah, discuss it a little bit. Yet we love to play as kids. This was punished in us by men who did the same things themselves. However, the trivial concerns of adults are called business, while such things in children are punished by adults. That's funny. Think about that, parents. Okay. Um, baptism deferred. Uh, this is interesting. Should he have done this? Should that have happened? It was deferred for different reasons. And, yeah, he hated Greek and math, but loved these stories. I like that chapter. And chip 15, prayer. Let's read this real quick. Prayer, chapter 15, a prayer for God's help. Page 16. Book 1. Graciously hear my prayer, O Lord, lest my soul falter under your correction, lest I falter in confessing to you your mercies, by which you have delivered me out of all my most wicked ways. Grant this so that you may grow sweet to me above all the allurements that I followed after. May I love you most ardently. May I cling to your hand with all my heart. Do you deliver me from all temptation even to the end? Behold, O Lord, you are my King and, God, and my God. Grant that whatever useful thing I learned about as a child may be put to your service. May whatever I speak and write May whatever I read and calculate serve you. For when I learned vain things, you gave instruction to me. You forgave me my sin of delight and those vanities. I learned many useful words and such studies, but they could have been learned from things that were not in vain. This last is a safe way in which children should walk. Hey, there was a book I read, Jenny Allen, called Restless. And I think a lot of, some of the stuff in that book is fantastic. She argues that, as Augustine here, we learned all this stuff, we had all these experiences as a kid, some horrible, some good, but we can weave all these together into a tapestry and take that in the future and use that for great good to serve God. Now, if you're an atheist, you're not going to serve God, but you might be able to take a lot of these things where, wow, I, all my interests and my skills, these things I learned as a kid, and some all my experiences, I can weave these together into something really cool in the future in many different ways. So she suggests actually writing out these, making a chart, and actually getting other people to look at it. Since some of us, we, we're, we're myopic. We can't see uh, the forest or the trees in front of us. 
So sometimes it helps to have a good friend look, oh, yeah, you were a pilot back when you were in college. Wow, you can use that, your pilot's license for this and your other interest here in uh, studying Buddhism or whatever. All right. Um, chapter 17, trading our destiny for porridge. Do you guys know the story of Jacob and Esau? Esau was hungry and he traded his birthright to Jacob for just some food on one afternoon. And what a mistake and regret he had. How many? How often do we do this? So, book one, chapter 17, paragraph 27, he says this, Grant me, my God, to speak a little about my own abilities, your gift to me, and of the foolish things on which they were squandered. So, later he says, What did all this matter to me, my God, my true life? What was all this but smoke and wind? So we, I mean, this is all ethics. Like, What do we value? What are we investing our time in? How are we living? Okay. Chapter 18, grace for us. Uh, it's interesting, at the end of chapter 18, he's more worried about grammar than murder. And chapter 20. I like this too. I just love reading some of the stuff. Just we get to see his heart. And this is a great, this book, those of you who don't know the worldview of Christian theism, I think this is a good book to be exposed to. I don't agree with everything he says here or things, but I think you get a good taste for um, Christianity in this, in this book and the experiential side of it from a believer. Chapter 20, Book 1, A Prayer of Thanks. Paragraph 31. But yet, Lord, thanks must be given to you, our God, the most excellent and best creator and ruler of the universe, even if you had willed only to bring me to childhood. Even then I existed, had life and feeling, had care for my own well-being, which is a trace of your own most mysterious unity from which I took my being. By my inner sense I guarded the integrity of my outer senses, and I delighted in truth, in such little things and in thoughts about such little things. I did not want to err. I was endowed with a strong memory. I was well instructed in speech. I was refined by friendship. I shunned sadness, dejection, and ignorance. What was there that was not wonderful and praiseworthy in such a living being? All these things are the gifts of my God. I did not give them to myself. These things are good and they all made up my being. Therefore, he who made me is good, and he is my good. Before him I rejoice for all those goods out of which I had my being, even as a child. But in this was my sin, that not in him, but in his creatures, in myself and others, did I seek pleasure, honors, and truths. So it was that I rushed into sorrow, conflict, and error. Let there be thanks to you, my sweetness, my honor, my trust, my God. Let there be thanks for you for these gifts. Keep them for me, thus you will keep me, and the things that you that gave and the things that you gave me will be both increased and perfected, and I will be with you, for you have also given it to me that I exist. I love that. That is a Christian who is grateful to God, who is his creator, and is aware go back to natural theology. Look at all these little things that didn't have to exist. G.K. Chesterton did a great job on this in, chap um, the eth in the chapter called The Ethics of Elfland. He's saying, if you look at the world, it could have been differently. What didn't you have to have? We didn't have to have platypuses or coconut trees. We didn't have to have the color blue. We didn't have to have music. We didn't have to have um, red roses. We didn't have to have mountains. So given the radical contingency of all these things, and he's looking at specifically his childhood and his history, wow, look at all these little good things that he had. The friendship, you know, we talked about that with Aristotle last week, the Nicomachean Ethics, how, how friendship was so important to him for the humans, for flourishing individuals, to be flourishing individuals. And he's, you know, his, this is his confessions, he was, he was aware that he worshipped the creature rather than the creator. This came out of Paul, Romans 1. 
And yeah, seek and you shall find. All right. So, philosophy of love, sex, and marriage. I think these are interesting. We could talk about love and lust. I think this is a. Uh, um, a very interesting thing. So the philosophy of love, sex, and marriage is very important and it drives our lives like nothing else. So when you say, I love you romantically to someone, what the heck do you mean? Some people say it too early. Some people don't say it too late. They don't know what love is. They confuse it. Jane says, I don't know what love is. I just know they want me. If anybody's a Jane's Addiction fan. It's the philosophy of sex. What is sex? When is it morally right? When is it morally wrong? And marriage. What is marriage? What should marriage be? And how do love, sex, and marriage all relate, if at all? So here Augustine admits he confused two kinds of affections. What were these and how they might how might become a eunuch and being married have mitigated the pain produced by this confusion. So yeah, look this up, what do you think? Explain your own philosophy of love if you want on the discussion board. The four loves in Greek, agape, that's God's unconditional love, agape. Storge, that's affection love that you might have for a pet, a child, or uh, your car. Eros, that's uh, romantic love. Phileo is friendship and brotherly love. So your philosophy of love might com combine four of those or one of those. You tell us. What do you think? And yeah, let's discuss on the discussion board. Arrange marriages, help lustful people. And read four. Could this be true about God? Where he says this. You were always present to aid me, merciful in your anger and charging with the greatest bitterness and disgust all my unlawful pleasures so that I might seek after pleasure that was free from disgust to that end that, when I could find it, it would be in none but you, Lord, in none but you. Alright, if you've read C.S. Lewis's The Four Loves, he's going to talk about Eros and Venus. That's relevant to this chapter too. Peter Kreft, K-R-E-E-F-T, in his book, Love is Stronger Than Death, he talks about this intimacy that God wants with all of us. And then also, all of us try to find this intimacy and in illicit sexual contact, when really we can find the intimacy in God. And the next paragraph where um, C.S. Lewis argues that pain is God's megaphone. Yeah, when he goes on, um, what does he say? Sorry, let me back up again. You were always present to aid me, merciful in your anger, and charging with the greatest bitterness and disgust all my unlawful pleasures, so that I might seek after pleasure that was free from disgust, to the end that, when I could find it, it would be in none but you, Lord, and none but you. For you fashioned sorrow into a lesson for us, a lesson to us. You smite so that you may heal. You slay us so that we may not die apart from you. Wow, if that's true, if God really is prodding us with evil and these things, wow, that is fantastic. I like the imagery there where uh, um, we are prodded like a, a cattle. All right. And he, he said, when I. All right, we'll skip the rest. Chapter 3, um, a year of idleness. We ask yourself, what kind of a parent will you be? And, yeah, in 5, should Augustine's father have worried about his chastity? Should any father care? This is fun to talk about in class. Um, bring that up in the discussion board. You can talk about your fathers. Did your fathers, if you have a father, care about your chastity? Should he or should he have not have? Six is uh, Romans 1. Where he said this before. Where, um, so from the unseen wine of its own perverse will, tending down towards lower things, forgets you, its creator, and loves your creature, your creature more than yourself. So, and seven, interesting. 
Why did Augustine think God was silent and it was just his mom who warned against fornication? And what about the hoodlums on the street corner bragging about bad deeds? Were you guys influenced by the cool kids? You know, I like, I mean, Augustine's going back here, trying doing a little psychological analysis. What influenced him? I right, bring that up. If you want. And chapter four. This is fun. So my niece wrote this. I like being a bad girl. And if you saw The Dark Knight, which I think is the best one of the trilogy, uh, by far, as most humans believe, uh, yeah, as Alfred says, some people just like to uh, see, watch the world burn. All right, that was horrible. But, yeah, I don't know if she quite meant that. I like being a bad girl. Maybe, maybe not. But talk about that. All right. Okay, what do you guys think? You know, chop some of this up, throw any of it you want to talk about in the discussion board, and uh, pause if you want to read this slide and see. All right. Part two discussion questions. Um, lower beauties and highest goods. Then you have chapter six, the anatomy of evil. Oh, chapter five, that's why I mentioned the Joker as well. The higher goods. Um, Chapter 5, paragraph 10, where there's the uh, lower beauties and there's the highest goods. So, the end of that paragraph. So, the friendship of men bound together by a loving tie is sweet because of the unity that it fashions among many souls. With regard to all these things and others of like nature, sins are committed when, out of an immoderate liking for them, since they are the least goods, we desert the best and highest goods, which are you, O Lord of God, and your truth and your law. These lower goods have their delights, but none such as my God, who has made all things. For in him the just man finds the light, and he is the joy of the upright of heart. Okay. So six, you have a little bit more there. He talks about our hearts want God and a healthy fear of God. This is interesting. Thus the soul commits fornication when it is turned away from you, and apart from you seeks such pure, clean things as it does not find, except when it returns to you. Alright. So yeah, there's even elements of God and sin. This is very interesting. Even if you guys don't agree with this, I mean, read this as if it could possibly be true. And since Augustine is this natural theologian, as I've said, and he finds all this evidence for God's existence in all these different places. I mean, he thinks this just the massive amount of evidence when he goes back and looks at this stuff. So, you might be able to look at these things now in your life and maybe be like, maybe, is Augustine right about this? Could Augustine be right that God's behind this and this and this? Alright. Chapter 7, The Grace That Keeps and Heals, page 32. He mentions Psalm 115, 12. Psalm 53.8. And I want to read this. We want to ask this. How do we become this grateful? What does he think some people miss? So he says, Who is the man who will reflect on his weakness and yet dare to credit his chastity and innocence to his own powers so that he loves you the less as if he had little need far little need far that mercy by which you forgive sins to those who turn to you. There may be someone who has been called by you and has heeded your voice and has shunned those deeds which he now hears me recalling and confessing myself. Let him not laugh to scorn a sick man who has been healed by that same physician who gave him such aid that he did not fall ill, or rather that he had only a lesser ill. 
Let him therefore love you just as much, nay, even more. For he sees that I have been rescued from such depths of sinful disease by him who, as he also sees, has preserved them from the same maladies. All right. Book 2, Chapter 9, Evil Communications. Psalm 18, 113, if you want to look that up. Soul and Waste. And 10, let me read this. 10, which is 18. Who can untie this most twisted and, and intricate mass of knots? It is a filthy thing. I do not wish to think about it. I do not wish to look upon it. I desire you, O justice and innocence, beautiful and comely to all virtuous eyes, and I desire this unto the satiety that can never be satiated. With you there is true rest and life untroubled. He who enters into you enters into the joy of his Lord, and he shall have no fear, and he shall possess his soul most happily in him who is the supreme good. I fell away from you, my God, and I went astray, too far astray from you, the support of my youth, and I became to myself a land of want. Now, is this good news? I want to argue that even if Christianity is false. We want this to be true. These words of Augustine are deepest existential needs being satisfied, finding true rest and life untroubled, and entering into the joy of a God of love, the joy of knowing the true, the good, and the beautiful. So I think, tell me if I'm wrong in the discussion board. We should at least want that the God, Jesus revealed, who loves sinners and offers grace and peace and forgiveness to exist. So, yeah, and epistemically, yeah, if Jesus was who he said he was, if Jesus was God incarnate, boom. We've got better knowledge from there instead of secondhand from angels or prophets. So I think actually on this basis it should be the first worldview religion explored and the evidence for it. And just as another point, do any of your scientific atheist friends ever talk about the existential satisfaction of Christian theism? Do they grant this, what Augustine says here? That, you know what, it would be awesome if Christianity were true and a God loved me and could satisfy me and, and love me wholly like that. All right. I think that's a silencing of free speech. In America, it's, it's an issue that this has never brought up. Book three, Augustine's Later Youth. So, student at Carthage, have you known people who are in love with love? The more empty I was, the more distaste I had for it. This is an interesting question. I've known people who have dated people just because they want boyfriend or girlfriend. They don't really care who it is in there. That slot. Okay. Cicero was the guy who woke Augustine up from his dogmatic slumber. So, what was the effect of Cicero and philosophy on Augustine? What does he think of the good elements and negative elements of philosophy? Many philosophers are actually awakened by another philosopher. Kant, it was Hume. P tougher, I was awakened by Plato. I thought philosophy was stupid until I took political thinking and we read Plato's Republic. So, Plato woke me up. So, you, maybe Aristotle woke you up, or Socrates, who knows? Or maybe you're not awoke yet. All right. Chapter 5. Um, well, by the way, 2 Corinthians 2.16, um, Augustine quotes, Beware lest any man deceive you through philosophy and vain deceit. There's a lot of bad philosophy out there. C.S. Lewis said, Good philosophy must exist, if for no other reason. The bad philosophy needs to be answered. I think all of us can agree that Nazi philosophy is harmful and people, I mean millions and millions of people died. The jihadist Islamism that's behind, the philosophy behind the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, that is the number one problem in the world today in my view. This is a philosophical problem. So I think these people are deceived by these vain philosophies, but they don't realize it.
All right. Man, let me just read some of this. I like this. So he said, In my ordinary course of study, I came upon a book by a certain Cicero, and this work contains an exhortation of philosophy. This book changed my, affectation, my affections. It turns my prayers to you, Lord, and caused me to have different purposes and desires. So all my vain hopes forthwith became worthless to me, and with incredible ardor of heart, I desired undying wisdom. I began to rise up so that I might return to you. So he did not use the book to sharpen his tongue or become a better speaker. And he says it was not impressive by the way it's speaking, but rather what it spoke. Paragraph 8. How I burned, O oh my God, how I burned with desire to fly away from earthly things and upwards to you, and yet I did not know what you would do with me. For with you there is wisdom. Love of wisdom has the name philosophy in Greek. And that book set me on fire for it. There are some who may lead others astray by means of philosophy, coloring and falsifying their errors with that great and beauteous and honest name. Almost all such men, both of Cicero's name in the earlier periods, are marked out and refuted in that book. There also he makes clear the salutary warning of your spirit given to us through your good and devout servant. Quote, 2 Corinthians 2.16 Beware lest any man deceive you through philosophy and vain deceit, according to the tradition of man, according to the elements of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead corporeally. At the time, end quote, as that time as you, the light of my heart, do know these apostolic words were not yet known to me. But I was delighted with the exhortation only because... By its argument, I was stirred up and enkindled and set aflame to love and pursue and attain and catch hold of and strongly embrace not this or that sect, but wisdom itself, whatsoever it might be. In so great a blaze, only this checked me, that Christ's name was not on it. For this name, O Lord, according to your mercy, this name of my Savior, your Son, my tender heart, had whole, wholly drunken in with my mother's milk and kept me down and kept deep down within myself. Whatever lacked this name, no matter how learned, polished, and voracious it was, cannot wholly capture me. All right. Chapter 5. Oh, he says he read the Bible, and it's like, this is stupid. This is just not, it doesn't sound like fancy and and appealing, you know? He just says it seemed unworthy as comparison to Cicero. So my swelling pride turned away from its humble style. Now, I think this is a good point. Like, Do we unfairly critique somebody in their writings because it's not what we expect? And so on. I was uh, talking with a student a few weeks ago about this in the Bible. It's not as, wow, the Bible isn't this doesn't look if I was going to be a God who revealed things to people putting a Bible I wouldn't do it like this I would do it like this Augustine says he was dumb that was the sin of pride but you be the judge alright so chapter 6 Manichaeans why was he deceived by them what was Augustine's mistake spend some time on this chapter and see now, chapter 7, Problems and Answers. Here we have philosophy of evil. So if you want to bring up the problem of evil, bring this up. Um, as we mentioned, evil is a privation of the good. Let's talk about that. Aristotle's categories, substances, accidents, and if you think that's an option. Arguments against moral relativism. Yeah, he argues for an objective moral law. So, relativism says either cultures or individuals get to vote and decide what's right or wrong. A moral realist or objectivist says no, that if a culture is a cannibalistic culture, they're actually wrong. You should not eat people in times of plenty or selling kids into sexual slavery. Okay, that's not right. And it's wrong to, particip wrong to participate in a brothel with children. That's the evil of all evils. So it doesn't matter if um, everybody in culture thinks that that's all right, morally okay. 
we can know through natural law that it's wrong. All right. So look at this and look at some. Yeah, what do you think? He thinks that some people are seduced to believe in relativism. A lot of you students think you're relativist. You're, what, 99.99999% of you are not. Once uh, you realize the objections to relativism. So read this and let's talk about moral relativism. Chapter 8, Natural and Positive Laws. Um, we'll read the last paragraph. Therefore, by humble devotion, return is made to you, and you cleanse us from our evil ways, and you're merciful to the sins of those who confess to you, and graciously hear the groans of those shackled by sin, and you free them from the chains that we have made for ourselves. This you do if you do not raise up against you the horns of a false liberty, an avarice of having more and more, an avarice of having more, and in danger of losing everything, and in putting more love upon our own personal good, and upon you, the God, the good of all that is. Yeah, he, look at him. God's mercy, grace, forgiveness. He just drips out of this stuff. All right. Monica's dream. Chapter 11. Said this. O you, o you, the good omnipotent, that means all powerful. O you, the good omnipotent, who so care for each one of us as if you care for him alone, and who care for all of us as for each single person. Think about that. That is awesome if that's true. That's beautiful. And if and if someone can't objectively look at this and be like, you know what? To be loved that much by a God that created the universe, that if that's true, that's awesome. Alright. You be the judge. This chapter twelve is so important. Spend your time on this passage, read this, and explain the interaction of Augustine's mother and the bishop. In his response to Monica, we see a lot of the bishop's theology and his view of persuasion. So explain these theological and psychological views of the bishop. Tell us what extent you agree with the bishop. Now, I love that yet. So we have a mother who goes to the church, I mean goes to the bishop, is like, please go talk to my son, who's a He's lost in believing this cult. He's a Manichaean and that kind of thing. And he said, But let him be. Only pray to the Lord on his behalf. He will find out by reading, which is the character of that error, and how great is it in piety. It's interesting because this bishop was a Manichaean himself. And he's like, Yeah, I just realized it was dumb after a while. So I left. And his mom didn't didn't buy it. She's like, no, go, go, talk to him, blah, blah, blah. And this is what the bishop says. Quote, go away from me now. As you live, it is impossible that the son of such tears should perish. End quote. As she was often wont to recall in her conversations with me, she took this as if, as if, she took this as if it had sounded forth from heaven. So, I think we need to know if you believe X, Y, and Z, and there is a loving God, He's, on this view, sometimes you have to let people be. You can't just argue every second you can with them. And some things just take time. Alright. I love that. So here, your part two critical responses, post on the discussion board, boom, boom, boom. Now, reading response, AC 1.2 over book 4. Uh, yeah, why was Augustine drawn to the astrologers and not the soothsayers who would sacrifice animals to help his career? And optional question, in your experience, what is the reason why some theists, people who believe in God, prefer astrology and physics and psychics? 
to find answers instead of spending time in prayer, meditation, and studying and seeking to hear God. Dallas Willard wrote one of the most important books, I think, Hearing God, Developing a Conversational Relationship with God. So he starts with 1 Samuel. We have little Samuel um, running to Eli. And you can listen to it free on YouTube. I think he ex teaches it on there. But if this is possibly true, if as Dallas Willard believes, he was a philosopher at USC, passed away a couple of years ago. I had a class for him with him back in uh, May 1997. Yeah, I'm old. Out in La Mirada, California. Anyway, Dallas Willard, he argues that, hey, God is always, a loving God is always talking to us, sending us radio waves. But most of us don't have ears that are tuned to hear God's voice when it comes. So this takes work and practicing the spiritual disciplines, as Jesus modeled, for us to hear God's voice more clearly. So yeah, if you want to understand Christianity, I think Dallas Willard is one of the best authors ever to do it. And he's got the most gentle spirit. Um, all right. Pause it and read this if you want. Okay. Book 4.4, 4, The Death of a Friend. Hey, I like this. So read this. Let's, let's talk about the philosophy of friendship. We're going to recontinue discussion for books 8 and 9 of um, Nicomachean Ethics. And, I mean, I think we really need to think deeply about a philosophy of friendship. Drawing good boundaries. If you ever read Henry Cloud and John Townsend about boundaries, what is a healthy friendship? What, we need friendships to flourish. I think that's one of the biggest problems in American society today. So I know a lot of people that just don't have any friends, any deep, true friendships, as Aristotle said we need. We just have uh, friendships of utility and what have you. So think about this. Um, also, think about your philosophy of grief. And how well have you mourned? Have you seen good and bad examples of mourning? Have you, have you got better at it? Or is it just different for each person? Um, yeah, I did a... Uh, I shadowed a, the chief ethicist at the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati and MICU and I saw all kinds of drama and people react, override, do not resuscitate orders, all this stuff. And it's like, man, people are just a mess. And so we need to work on becoming people of virtue and having the correct thoughts and beliefs. Also, we are built to love deeply. What does this say about humans? Is this best explained by naturalistic evolution, or is this best explained by God designing us, even if God used evolution to create us? All right. Think about that. That's Augustine's project and all this natural theology. Look at all this evidence for God's existence, just covering everything in grief, and friendship, and sex, and everything else. All right. Chapter 12, Life and Death. Here we see Augustine's theology of the relationship of God to the world and the error of human beings, which is similar actually to the error of people trapped in Plato's cave. Yet throughout the Confessions, we see Augustine's talk about this error, as Paul emphasized it in Romans 1, where we love the creature rather than the creator. And Augustine quotes Paul in Acts 17 over and over again. So let's look at this chapter 12. So book 4, chapter 12, 18. If you find pleasure in bodily things, praise God for them and direct your love to their maker, lest because of things that please you, you may displease them. If you find pleasure in souls, let them be loved in God. In themselves they are but shifting things. In Him they stand firm, else they would pass and perish. In Him, therefore, let them be loved, and with you carry up to Him as many as you can. So, wow, yeah. If souls exist, they need God to keep them in existence and keep them firm. He's saying, yeah, 
we can have, think souls exist. God's the best explanation of them. You look at uh, things on this earth, you got to give thanks to the Creator. That's why I think G.K. Chesterton's Ethics of Elfland, that chapter is so important on the radical contingency to make us realize, whoa, this world did not have to be like this. And what is the best explanation of colors, the taste of coffee, sunsets, and love, existence of friendship, and so on? All right. To go on, he says, say to them, quote, let us love him for he has made all things. He is not far from us. He did not make all things and then leave them, but they are from him and in him. Behold where he is. It is wherever truth is known. He is within our very hearts, but our hearts have strayed far from him. Return, you transgressors, to the heart. All right. I like this next thing on Jesus on 19. But our life came down to us. And he took away our death, and he slew it out of the abundance of his own life. So yeah, there in paragraph 19, book 4, chapter 12. So, yeah, talk about some of the things he finds remarkable about Jesus, and reflect on this. If you're a skeptic, if this might be true, what strikes you as amazing in these claims about the person of Jesus? Well, if you think anything is amazing, maybe not. If it helps, contrast these claims with claims about other religions. So this is going to be one thing that helped Augustine. He was always contrasting different worldviews and different beliefs in, in the worldviews. All right. Part two, critical response. Give us something you like and are excited to talk about. And let's bring it up. And Pursuit of Truth, Book 4, Chapter 15, if that's interesting to you. where he talks about error, false conceptions of God, uh, he talks about Aristotle's categories, and so on. All right. By the way, as a side note, Book 5, Chapter 2, it reminds me of Boyle, Robert Boyle, who was one of the philosophers who helped drag uh, chemistry from alchemy into modern chemistry. There was a... The people started becoming because of mechanistic philosophy, atheism started becoming on the rise. And all these pastors wrote Boyle and said, hey, why don't you do something about this? And Boyle's like, I don't care. Those people are dumb. If they think the mechanistic philosophy gives rise to atheism, they're not aware of all this other evidence for God's existence that just covers everything. And that's where I think Augustine is, Augustine is instructive. All right. Oh, so yeah, I mentioned this here. So some naturalists, I think scientific atheists, who are not trained in philosophy, often think explains way too, explains way too much. So they falsely assume prediction equals an explanation. And they never ask how it is that we can reason about these things. So as my naturalist friends will admit, it's hard to save knowledge on, on naturalism. It's hard to save the project of science if there's not a loving God who designed us to actually have true, discover true things about the world. Okay? That's a more complex conversation, so let's post it. In 547, let's read this real quick. Message to scientists. Oh, pride of science here. Let's read this. So, where is this? So, we'll skip down. These are both. These are both are good. Faustus, the Manichaean, and the astronomers in chapter four: Knowledge and Happiness. All right, Book 5, Chapter 4, Paragraph 7. Lord God of truth is whoever knows these things by that fact pleasing to you. No, unhappy is the man who knows all this but does not know you. Happy is he who knows you even if he does not know such things. Indeed, a man who knows both you and these things too is not happier because of them but because of a you alone is happy. If knowing you... And 
so on. Well, read that. Let me let's go back. I apologize. Book five, chapter three, four. By their own minds and by that ingenuity with which you endowed them, they investigated these matters and made many discoveries. Many years in advance, they foretold eclipses of the great luminaries, the sun and the moon, telling on what day, at what hour, and to what extent they would be, and the calculations did not fail them. The event proved as they had foretold. The principles that they had discovered, they put down in writing, and they are read to this day. According to these rules, predictions are made in what year and what month of the year, on what day of the month, on what hour of the day, and in what part of the light the sun or moon is to be eclipsed, it comes to pass as is predicted. Men who do not understand such matters stand in amazement and wonder at all this. Those who understand them exult and are elated. Out of an impious pride, they fall back from you, and they suffer an eclipse of your light. So early can they foresee a coming eclipse of the sun, but their own present eclipse they do not see, for they do not seek with a devout mind whence it is that they possess a skill by which they seek out these things. But when they find this, because you have made them, they do not give themselves up to you, so that you may preserve what you have made, and they do not stay slay <coughs> excuse me, and sacrifice to you what they have made themselves to be. Nor do they slay their own prideful boasts, which are like the fowls of the air, of their selfish curiosity, which is like the fishes in the sea, by which they wander along the hidden paths of the deep, or the carnal indulgence, which is like the beasts of the field, so that you, O God, who are a devouring flame, may consume their dead cares and recreate them deathlessly. But, paragraph 5, But they do not know your, the way, your word, by which you made the things that they number off, and they, and themselves who number, and the sense by which they discern what they number, and the intellect by which they number. This is powerful, I think. I, most people in the street, vast majority of Americans, have no idea the problems that uh, naturalists, scientific atheists have in trying to explain knowledge and scientific realism. Okay? Now, some of my friends who don't care about that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> but the medievals thought science is possible because God made us to do science, to get us out of the skepticism. All right, I'm glossing over a lot of these issues, but... It's just an important question. If science was not a gift from God, how do we know things? So we need to ask that. You be the judge. John Stuart Mill, some of you guys are going to do that in my class on liberty. Where, yeah, Faustus is teacher. The importance of understanding opponents' arguments is important to make sure we have the truth ourselves. We could be wrong. And, yeah, there's a huge problem of dismissing objections and ignoring the intellectual life. Christians are sometimes the worst at this. So I know a Marcus, a Buddhist monk, um, he's at Raps and Choling in Switzerland. Um, Mont Pelerin, Switzerland. And B. Allen Wallace, who's a scholar, Tibetan Buddhist. These guys went to their pastors with questions. Hey, what about this and this? And the pastor's like, shh, don't ask those questions, just believe. Turn up the music. And this is just ridiculous. This is not the faith that Jesus and Paul preached. If you read Acts, Paul and Acts, if you read Augustine, you see how he's given arguments, a thousand arguments, all throughout this book, trying to argue for God's existence. All right, God's evidence. So Augustine was frustrated with unanswered questions from Manichaeanism. That helped him get out of there just as the bishop predicted. Okay. These last... We can kind of uh, blow through some of this. But this is very interesting. There's an intellectual conversion. He's like, whoa, I understand this is true. Christianity. This is a true worldview. But then he's like, oh, this requires me to submit my heart, soul, and mind. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to wait. So keep read this and see what keeps him from the emotional conversion, the stepping out of faith. Where faith, you know, as 
we're going to define it as the New Testament, is trusting. Just like you believe the ice will hold you, you don't have faith until you go out there and actually trust the ice with your life. So yeah, use this definition of faith on the discussion board. It's trust in things we have good reason to believe are true, not blind faith. And just to ask how many people you know get this wrong. Because you have all this... Yeah, just look on TV. The psychology of uh, Victorinus is interesting. So I read that and like, why do you think Victorinus hesitated to make a public profession of faith? Now what do you think? Was this resistance of Victorinus understandable to you in light of your experience and understanding of human psychology and sociology? In other words, would you have done what Victorinus did? Let me know. I like that uh, the parable of the lost son. If you guys don't know it, Google Luke 15, Bible Gateway, and read this parable of the lost son. And chapters 3 and 4, uh, Augustine kind of uses that. And let us know. Now, all of us, some of us might be happy for the prodigal son who's loved and the father's looking for him. But some people get bitter and they agree with the older brother that the younger son's a schmo and the father was wrong but read that and it's a good psychological test of where you are all right post on the discussion board if we talk about it. so the inner conflict chapter five we're we're in book eight by the way book eight chapter five I think this is good. Yeah, he says we need stories of others. You know, give me chastity and continence, but not yet. And if you want, tell us what Aristotle would say about all this. Also, do you think Augustine thinks that the enemy, Satan, which is a non-physical person with powers on his view, actually did something to Augustine when he says the enemy fashioned a chain and fettered me with it? Or do you think it's a result of Augustine's own choices in the subsequent habituation and device? So, take us... For your part two for this um, third reading response, you might want to deal with this passage here. All right, naked self, voice of continence, give me chastity and continence, but not yet. Joy and chastity, is that possible? Read this 27, if you want to talk about that. The voice of a child. So after reading this, explain your reaction to your groups. What do you think? Should we ask for and expect this to happen if God is the God Jesus revealed? And the God Jesus revealed is a loving God that cares about all of us. And even the worst sinners. So, what do you guys think? Theory of conversion. Alright, we need to ask, how free are you? Are you free enough to even be open to something like this? If there is a God, if she exists, and God wants to reach us. Are you free enough to leave your worldview if it's false. What would it take? I don't think most of us are free enough. I mean, Augustine talks about how he was chained intellectually, emotionally throughout his life and how it is just darn difficult to do philosophy, find the truth, leave what you believe, and so on. So that's why I think this confession is fascinating with all this stuff. All right. I like this passage, Iron My Own Will. What do you guys think about this? And Battle of the Will. All right. So, St. Anthony of Egypt. <coughs> Let's see if you want to... talk about this
Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, this is an interesting point. And a student in my class was offended by this survey. You can't be offended by a survey. People say something. Why are you offended? That's just an attempt to silence free speech. Okay. Now, in the 21st century, next to having inadequate father figures, the vast majority of American atheists say that the number one reason why they hold this worldview is that they'll, so they'll be able to do whatever they want sexually. I don't know where that survey was taken, but that was A, why am I an atheist? The non-rational reasons were I didn't have a dad or I hated my dad. And secondly, I want to do whatever I want sexually. So if there is a God, God cares about my sex life. And I don't want there to be a God so I can do whatever I want in my sex life. So, yeah. What do you guys think? If you want to talk about this. All right, let's read Copleston on Augustine's conversion. Quote, It's perfectly clear that the conversion which then took place was a moral conversion, or a conversion of will, a conversion which followed the intellectual conversion. His reading of Neoplatonic works was an instrument in the intellectual conversion of Augustine, while his moral conversion, from the human viewpoint, was prepared by the sermons of Ambrose, in the words, is Simplicanius, and Pontitanius, and confirmed and sealed by the New Testament. The agony of a second or moral conversion was intensified by the fact that he already knew what he ought to do, though on the other hand he felt himself without the power to accomplish it. And to the words of St. Paul, however, which he read in the garden, he gave under the impulse of grace a real assent, and his life was changed. In other words, that's when he trusted and had faith. Alright. Book 9. Um, if you want to look at... Uh, some of his stuff talked about his mom. I think this is fantastic what he said about his his mom. And what a woman. I would say Monica was a fantastic woman. So maybe she'll influence your pers your uh, theory of motherhood. All right. So I think these are important questions. Where Augustine went back and forth between having anger and pity for the Manichaeans, but he wished they could turn from seeking joy in outward things and see that inner eternal light which I had tasted. So it's difficult for skeptics to believe these kind of claims since they have not experienced these things themselves. Now I would argue again, even if Christianity is false, it seems like this might be something humans would want to know if this is true or false. So we have to seek. Also, what do you think is a large obstacle for people throughout history to start the search to see if Augustine is right about this peace and rest and inner eternal life that he thought was available to all of us through the person of Jesus? Why do you think people don't seek? Why don't people care? So, choose your part two questions. Hopefully, maybe one of these issues is of interest. Because then. All right, time and eternity. Um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting he invokes God in his philosophical speculations. He addresses him as he writes. And Psalm to the same and others. All right, we're not going to talk about the philosophy of time here. Um, we're not going to fool out of the city of God. But if you wanted to talk about this, stuff you can do that on the discussion board and I will respond <laughs> but anyway these are not just confessions of sins but confessions as uh, Ryan puts it of his life and how well his discovery of God and he confesses how God has worked through him in these latter books where he goes through Genesis and so on You know, there's good stuff in these chapters, in these books. I should make you guys read it. Read them someday if you don't read them now. And email me if you want to talk about it. Let's 
we can talk about it. Any of these things. All right. Final thoughts on Augustine. Man, there's so many people. Ravi Zacharias, Dallas Willard, William Lane Craig, J.P. Moylan. These guys are a great start. These websites. Faith Seeking Understanding. These, a Christian who is an intellectual looking for evidences. Natural Theology. Look at all this evidence for God's existence from the possibility of science, from the existence of colors. Potentially. Maybe you're not going to be convinced those are arguments. But Augustine saw God's goodness and God's grace and God's creation and all this stuff. All right. Dirty projectors covered. Bob Dylan. I want to say something about Peter Kreft. I would encourage you guys all to read Peter Kreft the rest of your lives. He's got some fantastic books. Between Heaven and Hell, I read that in the summer of 1994, Yellowstone National Park. And I was just, it was fantastic. It's a dialogue between Aldous Huxley, C.S. Lewis, John F. Kennedy. Fictional dialogue. They all died the same day. Socrates meets Jesus, where Socrates goes to Harvard and meets a Christian and talks to him. Socrates meets Marx. So I think um, some of his books are great. Love is Stronger Than Death, I mentioned earlier. Um, his book on suffering, I think, is the best book on suffering out there, where it's called Making Sense of Suffering. So I spoke at my grandpa's funeral with uh, Love is Stronger Than Death, some stuff from there, way back in 2002. All right. So yeah, check out Peter Kreft, where he, he unpacks Augustine. If you want, look at the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy or the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, Spark Notes, online confessions, online videos. Check these out. If you want any of the stuff's fair game on the discussion board, post it. Let's talk about it. Anything you find interesting. All right, guys. Today is 26 June 2017, live from St. Xavier University in southwestern Chicago. All right. See you in the discussion board. This is tougher.